Sumerian is the language of ancient Sumer and a language isolate which was spoken in southern Mesopotamia. During the 3rd millennium BC, a very intimate cultural symbiosis developed between the Sumerians and the Akkadians, which included widespread bilingualism. The influence of Sumerian on Akkadian is evident in all areas, from lexical borrowing on a massive scale, to syntactic, morphological, and phonological convergence. This has prompted scholars to refer to Sumerian and Akkadian in the third millennium as a sprach bund. Akkadian gradually replaced Sumerian as a spoken language around 2000 BC, but Sumerian continued to be used as a sacred, ceremonial, literary and scientific language in Mesopotamia until the 1st century AD. Then it was forgotten until the 19th century. When Assyriologists began deciphering the cuneiform inscriptions and excavated tablets left by these speakers, varieties, stages the history of written Sumerian can be divided into several periods. Archaic Sumerian, 31st 26th century BC, Old or Classical Sumerian, 26th 23rd century. BC, Neo-Sumerian, 23rd minus 21 stone century BC, Late Sumerian, 20th 18th century BC, Post-Sumerian, after 1700 BC, Archaic Sumerian is the earliest stage of inscriptions with linguistic content, beginning with the Gemdet Nasa period from about the 31st to 30th centuries BC. It succeeds the proto-literate period, which spans roughly the 35th to 30th centuries. Some versions of the chronology may omit the late Sumerian phase and regard all texts written after 2000 BC as post-Sumerian. The term post-Sumerian is meant to refer to the time when the language was already extinct and only preserved by Babylonians and Assyrians as a liturgical and classical language. The extinction has traditionally been dated approximately to the end of the Third Dynasty of Ur, the last predominantly Sumerian state in Mesopotamia, about 2000 BC. However, this date is very approximate, as many scholars have contended that Sumerian was already dead or dying as early as around 2100 BC. By the beginning of the Earth Free period, while others believe that Sumerian persisted as a spoken language in a small part of southern Mesopotamia until as late as 1700 BC, whatever the status of spoken Sumerian between 2000 and 1700 BC, it is from this period that a particularly large quantity of literary texts and bilingual Sumerian Akkadian lexical lists survive, especially from the scribal school of Nippur. This, along with the particularly intensive official and literary use of the language in Akkadian-speaking states during the same time, is the basis for the distinction between a late Sumerian period and all subsequent time. Dialects Two varieties of Sumerian are recorded. The standard variety is called Emegir. The other recorded variety is called Emesal, though often translated as women's language. Emesal is used exclusively by female characters in some literary texts. In addition, it is dominant in certain genres of cult songs. The special features of Emesal are mostly phonological, but words different from the standard language are also used. Grammatical overview. Sumerian is an agglutinative language, meaning that words could consist of a chain of more or less clearly distinguishable and separable affixes and or morphemes. Sumerian is a split ergative language. It behaves as a nominative accusative language in the first and second person of present future tense, incompletive aspect, but as ergative absolutive in most other forms of the indicative mood. Similar patterns are found in a large number of unrelated split ergative languages. In Sumerian the ergative case is marked by the suffix e and the absolutive case by no suffix at all. Example of the ergative pattern, Lugal e tu mu undu three, the king built the house, Lugal barge en, the king went. Example of the nominative accusative pattern, I three do un, I go, e two ib two do three un, I build the house. 
Sumerian distinguishes the grammatical genders human, non-human, but it does not have separate male, female gender pronouns. The human gender includes not only humans but also gods and in some cases the word for statue. Sumerian has also been claimed to have two tenses, but these are currently described as completive and incompletive or perfective and imperfective aspects instead. There are a large number of cases. Absolutive, ergative, genitive, k, dative, allative for human nouns, e for non-human nouns, locative, commutative, equative, directive, adverbial, ablative. The naming and number of the cases varies in the scientific literature. Another characteristic feature of Sumerian is the large number of homophones, which are perhaps pseudo-homophones. As there might have been differences in pronunciation such as tone or some phonemic distinctions that are unknown, the different homophones are marked with different numbers by convention, 2 and 3, being often replaced by acute accent and grave accent diacritics respectively. For example, do equals go, do 3 equals do equals build. The standard modern grammar of Sumerian is that of Dietz Soto Edzard. Classification. Sumerian is a language isolate. Ever since decipherment, it has been the subject of much effort to relate it to a wide variety of languages. Such proposals enjoy virtually no support amongst linguists because of their unverifiability. A few examples of proposed linguistic affiliations include Kartvelian languages, Munda languages, Dravidian languages. Uralic languages or, more generally, Ural-Altaic languages, Basque language, Nostratic languages, Sino-Tibetan languages, close to Tibetan and Burmese, or, more generally, Denic or Caucasian languages. It has also been suggested that the Sumerian language descended from a late Paleolithic Creole language. However, no conclusive evidence, only some typological features, can be found to support Hoy Rupp's view. A more widespread hypothesis posits a Proto-Euphratian language that preceded Sumerian in southern Mesopotamia and exerted an aerial influence on it, especially in the form of polysyllabic words that appear un-Sumerian, making them suspect of being loan words and are not traceable to any other known language. There is little speculation as to the affinities of this substratum language, or these languages, and it is thus best treated as unclassified. Researchers such as Gonzalo Rubio disagree with the assumption of a single substratum language and argue that several languages are involved. A related proposal by Gordon Whitaker is that the language of the proto-literary texts from the late Uruk period is really an early Indo-European language which he terms Euphratic writing system. Development The Sumerian language is one of the earliest known written languages. The proto-literate period of Sumerian writing spans c. 3300 to 3000 BC. In this period, records are purely logographic, with no linguistic or phonological content. The oldest document of the proto-literate period is the Kish tablet. Falkenstein lists 939 signs used in the proto-literate period. Records with unambiguously linguistic content, identifiably Sumerian, are those found at Gemdet Nasa, dating to the 31st or 30th century BC. From about 2600 BC, the logographic symbols were generalized using a wedge-shaped stylus to impress the shapes into wet clay. This archaic cuneiform mode of writing coexisted with the pre-cuneiform archaic mode. DML lists 870 signs used in the early dynastic year period. In the same period the large set of logographic signs had been simplified into a logosyllabic script comprising several hundred signs. Rosengarten lists 468 signs used in Sumerian Lagash. The pre-Sargonian period of the 26th to 24th centuries BC is the classical Sumerian stage of the language. The cuneiform script is adapted to Akkadian writing from the mid-third millennium. Our knowledge of Sumerian is based on Akkadian glossaries. 
During the Sumerian Renaissance of the 21st century BC, Sumerian is written in already highly abstract cuneiform glyphs directly succeeded by Old Assyrian cuneiform. Transcription Transcription, in the context of cuneiform, is the process in which an epigraphist makes a line art drawing to show the signs on a clay tablet or stone inscription in a graphic form suitable for modern publication. Not all epigraphists are equally reliable, and before a scholar publishes an important treatment of a text, the scholar will often arrange to collate the published transcription against the actual tablet to see if any signs, especially broken or damaged signs, should be represented differently. Transliteration is the process in which a sumerologist decides how to represent the cuneiform signs in Roman script. Depending on the context, a cuneiform sign can be read either as one of several possible logograms each of which corresponds to a word in the Sumerian spoken language, as a phonetic syllable, or as a determinative. Some Sumerian logograms were written with multiple cuneiform signs. These logograms are called Deary spellings, after the logogram, Deary, which is written with the signs S, I, and A. The text transliteration of a tablet will show just the logogram, such as the word, Deary, not the separate component signs. Historiography. The key to reading logosyllabic cuneiform came from the Behistun inscription, the trilingual cuneiform inscription written in Old Persian, Elamite and Akkadian. In 1838 Henry Rawlinson, building on the 1802 work of Georg Friedrich Grothefend, was able to decipher the Old Persian section of the Behistun inscriptions using his knowledge of modern Persian. When he recovered the rest of the text in 1843, he and others were gradually able to translate the Elamite and Akkadian sections of it, starting with the 37 signs he had deciphered for the Old Persian. Meanwhile, many more cuneiform texts were coming to light from archaeological excavations, mostly in the Semitic Akkadian language, which were duly deciphered. By 1850, however, Edward Hinks came to suspect a non-Semitic origin for cuneiform. Semitic languages are structured according to consonantal forms, whereas cuneiform, when functioning phonetically, was a syllabary, binding consonants to particular vowels. Furthermore, no Semitic words could be found to explain the syllabic values given to particular signs. Julius Oppitz suggested that a non-Semitic language had preceded Akkadian in Mesopotamia, and that speakers of this language had developed the cuneiform script. In 1855 Rawlinson announced the discovery of non-Semitic inscriptions at the southern Babylonian sites of Nippur, Lhasa, and Uruk. In 1856, Hinks argued that the untranslated language was agglutinative in character. The language was called Scythic by some, and, confusingly, Akkadian by others. In 1869, Oppit proposed the name Sumerian, based on the known title King of Sumer and Akkad, reasoning that if Akkad signified the Semitic portion of the kingdom, Sumer might describe the non-Semitic annex. Credit for being first to scientifically treat a bilingual Sumerian Akkadian text belongs to Paul Hout, who published Die Sumerischen Familie Engersetzer in 1879. Ernest de Sarzik began excavating the Sumerian site of Teo in 1877, and published the first part of Deku Virtus and Cholde with transcriptions of Sumerian tablets in 1884. The University of Pennsylvania began excavating Sumerian Nippur in 1888. A classified list of Sumerian ideographs by R. Brunauer appeared in 1889. The bewildering number and variety of phonetic values that signs could have in Sumerian led to an unfortunate detour in understanding the language. A Paris-based Orientalist, Joseph Halevi, argued from 1874 onward that Sumerian was not a natural language, but rather a secret code and for over a decade the leading Assyriologists battled over this issue. For a dozen years, starting in 1885, even the great Friedrich Dillich accepted Halevi's arguments, not renouncing Halevi until 1897. 
François Thurot Dungeon working at the Louvre in Paris also made significant contributions to deciphering Sumerian with publications from 1898 to 1938, such as his 1905 publication of Les Inscriptions de Sumer et de Card. Charles Fossey at the Collège de France in Paris was another prolific and reliable scholar. His pioneering contribution au Dictionnaire Sumerien Assyrien, Paris 1905-1907, turns out to provide the foundation for P. Anton DML's 1934 Sumerish Akkadicious Glosso. In 1908, Stephen Langdon summarized the rapid expansion in knowledge of Sumerian and Akkadian vocabulary in the pages of Babylonia Car, a journal edited by Charles Viroliud, in an article, Sumerian Assyrian Vocabularies, which reviewed a valuable new book on rare logograms by Bruno Meisner. Subsequent scholars have found Langdon's work, including his tablet transcriptions, to be not entirely reliable. In 1944, a more careful Sumerologist, Samuel Noah Kramer, provided a detailed and readable summary of the decipherment of Sumerian in his Sumerian mythology. Friedrich Dillich published a learned Sumerian dictionary and grammar in the form of his Sumeritius Glossa and Grundzüge der Sumerischen. Grammatic, both appearing in 1914, Delitz's student, Arno Pobel, published a grammar with the same title, Grundzüge der Sumerischen Grammatik, in 1923, and for 50 years it would be the standard for students studying Sumerian. Pobel's grammar was finally superseded in 1984 on the publication of the Sumerian language. An Introduction to Its History and Grammatical Structure by Marie-Louise Thompson While much of Thompson's understanding of Sumerian grammar would now be rejected by most oral Sumerologists, Thompson's grammar is the starting point of most recent academic discussions of Sumerian grammar. More recent monograph-length grammars of Sumerian include Dietz Soto Edzard's 2003 Sumerian Grammar and Bram Yegesmer's 2010A Descriptive Grammar of Sumerian. Pyotr Michalowski's essay in the 2004 The Cambridge Encyclopedia of the World's Ancient Languages has also been recognized as a good modern grammatical sketch. There is relatively little consensus, even among reasonable Sumerologists, in comparison to the state of most modern or classical languages. Verbal morphology in particular is hotly disputed. In addition to the general grammars, there are many monographs and articles about particular areas of Sumerian grammar, without which a survey of the field could not be considered complete. The primary institutional lexical effort in Sumerian is the Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary Project, begun in 1974. In 2004, the PSD was released on the web as the EPSD. The project is currently supervised by Steve Tinney. It has not been updated online since 2006, but Tinney and colleagues are working on a new edition of the EPSD, a working draft of which is available online.